Ron here from the hit podcast, The Other Side of Wall Street. And if you're like most of us here in the trading community, you no doubt have mentors or experts that you look up to for trading advice and knowledge. Well, how many times have you wished you could just sit down with one of those experts and have a good old one-on-one -on -one conversation with no script, no planned questions, just a friendly chat? Well, that's what we're bringing to you here. Each week, we'll visit with a different expert and have an up-close and personal conversation about anything and everything involving trading. So sit back and enjoy as we get to know our special guest. Welcome to The Other Side of Wall Street with your host, Ron Harrison. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to The Other Side of Wall Street. Uh, my name is Ron Harrison, and today I am very excited to have a special guest, Mr. Stuart McPhee. Welcome, Stuart. And in case, in case any of you don't already know who he is, he happens to be the author of a best-selling book called Trading in a Nutshell, which is in its fourth edition, which I enjoy thoroughly. Stewart's traded for over 20 years and has personally coached high net worth traders from all over the world. And he's helped countless traders improve their performance and his, with his expertise in technical analysis, trading psychology, risk management, the trading process, and developing a trading plan. And he now travels around the world conducting uh, staff and client training for various brokers. And I just want to say that uh, we've never spoken before this. This is our first time. I came across uh, one of your videos when I was researching another guest that was going to be on my show. And I just, some reason, stopped and listened to yours. And it was one on trading psychology, which that's what we focus here. That's what I focus on more than anything, because I really think that is the, I know you have a three-pillar approach. I really think trading psychology is actually the biggest of the three for the people I deal with, which are the beginning traders, the ones that have the bigger, uh, you know, percentage of failure. And, uh, but then the funny thing is, I feel like now, since, since I've watched that first video, I've watched many more of yours, and I feel like we're like old friends. And I say that because every time I watch one of your videos that I haven't watched already, things you say in it, most things you say in them are exactly what I preach, what I teach, what I talk about the way I phrase things, everything. So it's just uncanny that I found a person that covers almost every piece of what I say in my classes and whatever. And it's, it's just, I'm so excited to have you on. I, it's, I don't even know if I can get all of my questions in that I want to talk to you about in, in the time we got. But anyway, um, let's get started. I know you started trading in 1996, I think, right? Right. What, how did you, what got you into trading? How, how did you uh, go from, I guess, the military before that? Correct, yeah, during that, yeah. So I think like a lot of people, the way we start is we have a little bit of money put aside and we think we want to do something with this, with this money. We want to invest it. We want it to, you know, generate a return. And I remember seeing a financial planner at the time and not knowing what to do. The financial planner said, oh, you're young and you've got so many years ahead of you you should buy stocks, you know, you should buy equity. A um, little bit higher risk, uh, you've got plenty of time. I thought, okay. And I went to our stock exchange and see there's 2,000 stocks listed and there's many more on other exchanges around the world, but so far as the Australian one was concerned, there were 2,000. And well, that presented a bigger problem because we, we, which one do you which choose? One? Which five do you choose, you know? So I said that to her, I said, well, that's great, but what do I do now? Like, how do I choose? She said, oh, well, perhaps you can buy some in this bank. And I was sitting in a bank at the time, a listed company. So, well, that made one decision easy. I'll just buy stock in that bank. Good, I've checked off one that I have to purchase, but what about the other two or three I'm going to buy? I just had no idea. So would you believe my first shares, my first stock was in fact in that bank um, because it was I just didn't know where to go. So then I moved, um, and I, in the introduction, you say I started trading. I guess I started, I purchased my first stock in 1996. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I just know I wanted to put money somewhere that it could generate. Return. So when we moved to the US, in fact, in 1997 to 98, which seems like a long time ago now, um, it then really opened my eyes to the markets and I saw so much financial commentary on the television, on cable, you know, on cable TV. And I'm just watching all this, realizing how much I did not know about equities, about stocks. So that's really whetted my appetite. 
And when we returned to Australia in 1999, which also sounds like a long time ago, I set about learning more. And I spent a lot of money um, doing probably what some of your clients do, and that is signing a check and uh, you know, joining a course and learning a lot more about the structure of trading in the market. So really 1999, and again, that's a long time ago, was really the first time I had some inkling of what trading was and the process and what you do as a trader. So that 1999, 2000, and now you're talking about the NASDAQ boom and crash and everything, there was a lot to learn, there was a lot to see in those one or two years. And that was really the foundation of me understanding what this trading was all about. Certainly the psychology of it all, you mentioned that earlier because of how much money I lost when the NASDAQ crashed and how much money I lost trying to make it back uh, in the month or two afterwards. Um, that was an incredible learning curve. So yeah, that was a long time ago to answer your question, 96. Really didn't know what, what I was doing. Um, I talk about consistency a lot in trading. And when I started, I was very consistent in that I lost money almost every week. Um, so, you know, it was very much a learning curve and I could talk about this for a lot longer. But one thing I will say is during 99 and 2000, when I lost the amount of money that I did, it could have been very easy for me to simply walk away and never look at the markets ever again. It was that horrible an experience and not just the money I lost, the emotional, you know, I still have vivid memories and images of me literally standing in a shower and wanting to vomit and wanted to, I felt so physically ill with what I'd gone through and what it put me through and how much money I lost and all of that, the, the roller coaster of it all. And I could have easily walked away and never come back. The only thing that had me stay around was I saw it was possible. In mid-99 to 2000, I had actually made some money and I could see how it was possible to make a decision, manage risk well, have, have a position move well in your favour, manage that trade, you know, let the profit run a little bit, take it out. I could see that it was possible. And I think a big obstacle for many when they start is they're still very sceptical. Uh, is it actually, can you really, really do this? I hear people talk about it all the time, but is it actually possible? I'm not convinced. Okay, well, I had been convinced. So that was enough to keep me around and and then the rest is history. In one of your videos, you talk about the turtles, uh, turtle experiment, and uh, and how they, the fact that they were there following rules, they left and they went home and things changed. That is exactly, I mean, you can find that story of mine. I, I have it plastered everywhere. When I first started trading, I was on Wall Street working at a firm doing what they told me I had to do with their money. Now, I wasn't a broker, I was a trader. So I, there was there was a trading plan, there was a set of rules, and that was all that mattered. And then I thought the same thing you said in that video. Why am I doing this here? I can go home and do this. And I went home and did it, set the whole thing up. Sure enough, money started bleeding. And uh, that is really, after I figured that part out is what set me on the track of, okay, it's, it's, it's this that's causing the problem. It's not, it's not uh, anything else. So that's why since then I have been so fanatical about trading psychology, trading mindset, and so on. And I'm guessing you probably uh, had this, maybe the same epiphany at some point. Sorry, I'll just make a comment. That's very interesting. You talk about your own experience and how you've then gone home and thought, I've got a system that works. I've seen it work. I'm now convinced. And then all of a sudden there's no accountability. Mm -hmm. There's no looking over your shoulder. There's no, there's just simply no accountability. So easy to break the rules and then you obviously saw the results of that which I think is fascinating that um, you know what changed um, it was the environment and the impact it had on you so it wasn't the system it wasn't the markets it was your response and your actions and you know we talk about that being the weakest link um, mm -hmm. you are, and I say it often in to audiences that you know this is no offense but to them you know but you are the weakest link you are absolutely the weakest link in this entire program, this entire process, um, because of you know simple examples of what you've just mentioned. So I forget your question now about the epiphany. I think, yeah, the epiphany was that I had seen it was possible. Now, the unfortunate thing was I didn't dare have any money to trade with. I'd simply lost it all and some. So then I began 
a really a learning curve for the next 12 months or so where I did copious amounts of testing, just a ridiculous amount of testing and back testing and testing different systems and rules. And one of the things that I did learn during that, and I think a lot of people go through this, is one, we think trading is easy money. You only have to buy and sell. You know, how mm-hmm. difficult can that be? Then we quickly realise it's the hardest easy money there is. Mm-hmm. It's not that easy. Then when we accept that trading is actually quite difficult, quite a challenge, we intuitively think that a, a complicated, complex uh, process or system or set of rules is required. In fact, it's only a more complicated, complex system that will have any chance of making money because trading is so difficult and it's so challenging. Um, so it's counterintuitive to convince yourself that, in fact, very simple rules very simple approaches, technical analysis and the like can in fact be incredibly effective and quite successful. Um, That was an epiphany that I had in that 12 months was I began that whole testing of let's throw as many inputs into my decision making as I can because surely that will give me the greatest chance of being successful. Um, And I quickly realised that very simple rules were actually really quite powerful and quite effective and at the end of the day and we say this, you know, how many times have you said this to people and myself included, at the end of the day, your decision to open those trades is of little impact. It's what you do once you're in the trade. It's everything mm-hmm. beyond that. And it's everything when you get out in a losing position or in a profitable position and how you manage everything. Right. The reality is when you get into something, you really have no idea where it's going. Right. You have expectations and you have some hope which is not necessarily a good thing, um, but you really don't know. It's what you do everything, you know, everything after that. So but the epiphany I had was very simple approaches can be incredibly effective. And I still to this day have trouble convincing people that, you know, just try this set of rules here, add one or two things, and they're just sitting there. I can see it in their faces. They're just sitting there. There's no way that could work. Okay. Um, don't believe me. I'm giving you something, you know, do your own homework, go and validate this, prove it or disprove it, but don't sit there with your biases and just look me in the eyes and say, that's, you're wasting my time. Mm-hmm. You mentioned in the beginning uh, that when you came to the U.S., there was so much media uh, being pumped at you, and I find that with, with a lot of my students, that is the biggest problem of anything, is that there is so much input from the media the people, the traders, start forming opinions and biases of where they think wherever the stock's going to go, the market's going to go, because of what they've heard, not because they've done analysis, not because there are any facts, just because of hearsay, of media. And I try to tell them, I said, these are just opinions. Nobody, absolutely nobody, you know, knows where anything's going to be an hour from now, let alone next week, next month, next year. And right. that's, But then they start trading and they based on their opinions and their beliefs, and they won't give that up. So then you find they get into a trade, it goes bad, they hold on to it because they believe it's going to come back. And I know in some of your videos, you've touched on those things several, many times. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about the media. So when I didn't know any different and I was very much in the early phase and I was exposed to all that media commentary, I'm just sitting there, you know, wow, these, these people are so impressive, they're so educated this so wow these guys are amazing what they know about the markets and now i look back and think well i have for some time i look and i think it's not really that important and i think you can be easily overwhelmed with information they are just opinions no one knows um you know i i often one of my criticisms of i think commentary a lot is they tell you what's happened Mm -hmm. uh, and that doesn't help traders make money Um, And even if they provide some insight into, and I listened to a very, very, very well-prepared, very good presentation towards the end of last year from purely a fundamental analyst. And she was very, very good and delivered a very polished presentation for 30 minutes. And in the back of my mind through this whole, and I was invited, I should say, I was invited along as a guest of this particular broker. In the back of my mind at this whole time, I'm thinking, that's all great. But how do I make money on that? I think the litmus test, the real test is, can you develop a strategy based on that information? And I think everything she said, which all made sense, and it was all things that I had heard, it was about the 
Federal Reserve and what they'll do this year and all those sorts of different things that people always talk about. In the back of my mind was, okay, thank you. How do I develop a strategy based on that? Because if you can't, you know, what good is it? Mm-hmm. I think what you're trying to do is develop a strategy that we can apply into the markets with great consistency and regularity and do it over and over and over again. Um, you know, a lot of times commentary just simply talks about, oh, gold has, you know, surged higher today not based on, you know, escalating tension between Iran and the United States. Okay, thank you. Um, what can I do with that now in the next three or four days? Well, if you asked, they had the opportunity to go, oh, I don't, right. I don't know. Right. I'm just telling you what happened. That's what they do. <laughs> That's their job. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, if I just, one more thing, uh, one of the uh, person who used to work for CNBC in Asia, in Asia Pacific, um, who became a very good friend of mine with the amount of times I travelled to Singapore and I was involved with events with him. When he got that job, he had just completed a journalist degree and had no idea about markets. None, zero. No experience in financial markets and really no knowledge. Had, However, had done a journalism or something similar degree. So he was in a position to work in a media company and he delivered information mm-hmm. as a media person. And that's exactly what he did. Mm-hmm. And he would talk about, oh, this stock have just released their quarterly earnings. It's up 3.7% up to this. Okay. He would do that all morning. And then I think to myself, but how does that help traders make money? All right. All right. So, yeah, and he was supposed to be the expert, but he was really just reading or listening to what someone was telling him to say. Correct. The 1997 version of me would have looked at him and thought, wow, this guy's yeah. amazing. How much does I know? Listen yeah. to the way he's presenting so confidently and articulately. Just, wow, what a presenter. This guy's an expert. Well, I, I also tell the story in a lot of my uh, classes and whatever that when I first started, I was a broker. And in order to be a broker, you have to get what's a Series 7 license here in the U.S. I don't know what it is in Australia. But, equivalent, yes. but uh, when you go through the course, take the test, pass, and all that, there is absolutely nothing in that course that teaches you how to analyze a stock, read a chart, do anything except be legal, what to say, what not to say, all the, all the legalities involved in selling stocks. So then you go to the brokerage firm, and uh, your job is to get on the phone and call people, right? So they give you sheets, call sheets. So you get on the phone and start, start calling, hi, Mr. Mr. So-and-so, I have this great stock, I've done all this work, all this research, and you're just reading off a sheet of paper. You have no idea what you're talking about. You, have, you couldn't pick a good stock if you had to. But you're the broker trying to sell somebody something. I always say I spend all day calling people I don't know, trying to sell them things they don't want. I mean, terrible job. But you don't brokers, know. You know brokers, sorry, I was going to say, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think brokers generally are salespeople. Mm-hmm. Totally. That's yeah. their role. They need to ring up people on the phone and sell them you should buy this stock today mm-hmm. yeah That's job. and once they hung up hang up with you they're going straight on to the next number exactly next, person, yeah. next on their yeah. list do you still trade do you still trade yourself? are you still trading yourself on a regular basis? yeah so i have two very distinct trading systems which i'm happy to talk about one is with equities it's a longer term it's our retirement fund a lot of people in Australia manage their own retirement money under very, very strict guidelines, mind you. Um, but I'll, here. Sorry, you can't. They're, try, they're talking about trying to do that here. Okay, yeah, so it's very much, uh, it's a big industry, in fact, um, for people to set up their own retirement fund, needs to be audited and mm-hmm. heavily regulated, as it should be. Um, but I've had that since almost 20 years, my own retirement fund, so I trade very much equities in that, and I have another company account which trades currencies on a much more active, not super duper, not really, really active, but certainly more active than my equities stock trading. I found that uh, Forex is the hardest of the, of the three. And the th- by the three, I mean, uh, you got equities, you got commodities, futures, and you got currency or Forex. I find Forex is the hardest by far, at least for me. Yeah, look, I was, uh, look, for a long time, I didn't trade currencies for uh, Forex. I was very scared of it. All I'd heard about was how large the market was, the turnover, the liquidity, uh, the leverage. All of that scared me in a big t- in a big way. Um, during the global financial crisis of what 2008, when equities just fell and fell and fell, and my retirement money is sitting there in cash, I was I got out of. I still to this day amaze people that my retirement money throughout most of that year was in cash and not in equities. Not because I knew what was happening, but just simply because I followed rules. Mm-hmm. And when 
my prices all started to fall and my trailing exits were triggered. I got out of everything. I wasn't getting into anything. It's still a story I say with great pride, um, but I very quickly deflect to the point that I had no idea what was happening. But by that time in my trading life, I was very disciplined. I was very convinced of how important rules are <clears throat> and following those rules. And that's all I did was followed rules. And would you believe for 11 months of that year, my entire retirement fund was in cash. Mm -hmm. uh, and I still amaze people to this day and tell them that because a lot of people weren't. And that was because I followed rules. But during that year, the government stepped in and stopped uh, short selling. Um, simply to protect markets. And I think a lot of regulators around the world did that because once one country didn't do it but others did, then money would flow into that country and start short selling stocks because it was still allowed. Um, and then that country stopped it and then the money would pour into another. So it was almost inevitable that Australia, um, you know, adopted the same uh, rules and that's preventing. So all of a sudden I was left with nothing. Um, you know, I was short selling equities at the time through another account and then a friend of mine said, why don't you finally look at currencies? Finally, the currencies haven't stopped. And I'm going, okay, yeah, but I've always been scared of leverage and the size. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, platforms today, you can trade very, very small amounts. You can get, you know, you don't have to trade 100 to one. You can, you know, trade different leverage levels and okay, I'm interested. And that's where it started. And that's what, 12 years ago. And um, so I very, what I, you know, a number of things appeal to me about currencies. I think the lack of instruments. So all of a sudden I had a very finite list of products that I would trade, you know, in the order of, you know, eight to 10 and that was it. So that made analysis a lot easier. Um, the time taken to go through was a lot easier. Being able to very clearly define my risk management and the size of my trade and setting stops and the whole idea of setting and forgetting and putting a trade on the platform, walking away and never looking at it again. That mm -hmm. appealed to me. Um, as long as you do that pr you know, correctly in accordance with very good risk management rules. And all of a sudden I was hooked. You know, I really, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoy watching very, you know, I enjoy watching eight to 10 currency pairs and that's it. Um, I think you get to know them very, very well. And if you have someone tells you, I just trade the Dow or the S&P, they'll know that index Intimately, they'll know it incredibly well because that's all they trade. Okay. Um, well, I think it's similar with, you know, six, eight currency pairs. Mm -hmm. You get to know them very well. Um, and I can visualise right now a chart of the Euro US. Right now, I can, I can almost draw it for you right. because even though I had a break over Christmas New Year, I, you know, I, I look at it every day. Um, so I can tell you exactly what it looks like. Would you like to talk a little bit about uh, how you interact with, uh, I know you said you, you, coach uh, traders at, at firms, do you do any, any individual teaching training at all too, or is it all in, in institutional? It is uh, more group now, but in the early days it was very much personal, uh, individual, and it all started way back when I had no money to trade with and I didn't know what I was going to do, and I knew this is something I wanted to pursue and do for the long term, but I didn't have any money. Um, and I was part of some trading groups where all free, everyone just get together once a month or something and just have a coffee and have a drink and have a meal and discuss, you know, get your laptops out and just help each other, a real support network. And it was just simply from that, and I, I can till, still tell, I won't mention his name, but I can still tell you now, right, right now, my very first ever personal coaching client. Um, I can still tell you exactly where he lives. And I went and saw him for four hours one morning and I just stood there all morning. So as a coach, it was more as devil's advocate. It was almost, have you considered this? Have you thought about this? Why are you doing this? I'm challenging you. Convince me why you're doing that and to make them think about different ideas. And that was my first coaching session. Never any coaching experience or anything like that, but I was, I thought, intelligent enough to carry on a conversation about this and to challenge this person. Okay, you said you're doing this, but why? Do you think there's a better way? I mean, one of the things that I've learned is about perhaps considering this. Is that something you might want to consider? And that's what I did for four hours. And then sure enough, um, he he told a friend, and oh, get this, just for two hours, he'll make you think about different things. Guess what, I get a phone call. And that's how it started. And um, I mean, it's not a incredibly efficient way of making money, but it was good for me. I was enjoying it. 
I was uh, getting to know people. I was helping people. They were paying me, and it really helped me through a time when I really didn't have any money to trade with anyway. Um, one of the disadvantages of that, and I would actually physically drive to their homes and sit in their office and sit right next to them beside the very PC or laptop that they would sit to trade with, and we'd look, look at their screens and their platforms. And so it was very much a personal service I was providing, and I did that for several years. I tell you, one of the disadvantages, uh, and I would see a lot of repeat people as well, you know, once every three months we'd review. One of the disadvantages that I never shared with anybody, any of those clients, was I started to become personally attached, emotionally attached to them and their success or otherwise. And when they weren't successful and they were still struggling 12 months later, I was starting to question whether, in fact, what I was telling them was correct and was helpful. Now, I now look back at that and think, was nothing to do with me. I mean, it was just not everybody's built to be a trader, and we could talk about that for five hours, <laughs> the psychology and everything. <laughs> so, but not everyone's built to have the discipline and the pay, everything, you know, to be a trader. So at the time, though, I started to think, wow, am I not helping them? What am I saying that's wrong? Uh, what am I saying to them that's misleading? Um, and I started to feel that um, emotionally. I started to feel invested in their success. And that bothered me. Uh, I didn't. That didn't sit well with me. Uh, that some of these people were still struggling, and they were paying me money to come and help them, and I wasn't able to help them. Um, yeah. I, so I really, very turned off the idea of the personal coaching. And by that time, we're now talking about several years. And all of a sudden, I was starting to talk to a group, and then that they knew someone else. And you know, if you do well enough and you present a reasonable product. Someone's going to talk to someone else and go, okay, you should get this guy, come along and, you know, 